Professor Nora Gerardo Leeds is a senior lecturer of business administration in the finance and entrepreneurial management unit. Uh, she presently teaches real estate private equity and starting a private investment firm. I had the great honor of having Nora as a professor uh, last fall, and I would recommend her course to any RCs uh, tuning in today. Prior to teaching, Nori had a long and successful career in private real estate investing. Until 2011, Nori was a partner and chief strategist for private real estate and partners group. And she also founded and co-founded several uh, firms in the past, including Pension Consulting Alliance, which became the largest real estate advisory firm in the world. And um, more recently, she co-founded she founded, uh, Arate Capital, uh, another real estate advisory firm. As for our guest uh, keynote speaker today, uh, Monish is the founder and managing partner of Cabra Investment Funds, a family owned of investment funds that were inspired by the original um, Buffett partnerships of the 1950s and are a close replica of the original um, Buffett partnership rules. Prior to uh, PIF, he was the founder and CEO of TransTech, an IT consulting and systems integration company. Uh, which he sold in 2000. During his investing career, uh, Monish has written two books on value investing, The Dando Investor and Mosaic um, Perspectives on Investing. He graduated from Clemson University with a degree in computer engineering. Uh, and today he also serves as the founder and chairman of uh, Dakshana Foundation, a charity focused on poverty uh, alleviation through education. Monish and Ori, thank you both for being here today. I'll, I'll, I'll give up the floor to you now. Thank you, um, Alan. It's it's good to see you again. Um, and uh, Monish, thank you for agreeing to take time on a Sunday uh, to do this. You you must have a looking in behind you. You must have a penchant for cars. I see. Well, brand name, Ferrari, Maserati, Jeep. Uh, so they are all they are all owned by the same company, and in uh, 2012, I had uh, made an investment in Fiat Chrysler uh, automobiles, and uh, at that time, embedded within Fiat was also Ferrari, and they had just done the deal with uh, Chrysler in 2008. So basically, all of those brands: uh, Alfa, Maserati, Ram. And uh, and Ferrari and so on were all within that same umbrella, and uh, it was. Uh, I mean, I hated the auto industry all my life. I think it's a horrible industry, and um, it ended up being a spectacular investment because uh, because basically that that group had about 140 billion in revenue, and the market cap was five billion. Oh my god, <laughs> that's terrible. <laughs> And Ferrari alone is like 60 billion now. Well, kudos to you for, you know, finding that nugget in an industry that is, you know, has been over the decades, highly, highly cyclical and, and you know, at times horribly unprofitable and requiring major bailouts. But I wanted to, let's step back a little bit and, you know, you are characterized as a, a value investor. And, you know, maybe and in, in, in a, a follower of, of sort of the Warren Buffett type investment strategy, what does that, you know, what does that really mean? And then we'll dig a little into some of the other stuff that we had spoke about just previously. What is it, what does it mean to be, you know, what kind of, a, how do you characterize yourself? Are you like so, just another so the, Warren Buffett? So the dean or father of, or father of value investing is Ben Graham, who was uh, Warren Buffett's teacher, and uh, and actually Ben Graham kind of, you know, I don't know, people will think this is blasphemy, but Ben Graham kind of led us astray. He led me astray for a long time, and uh, and so if we go back to Ben Graham, you know, he he got. May, and maybe could you tell. tell, tell the audience who Ben Graham is, yes. they may not so, know who he is. Uh, ben, ben Graham uh, used to be a professor at Columbia. I mean, he passed away in the 70s. And uh, in, the, in the Great Depression and 
and the great crash 1929 to 32 and then all the way to 38 actually his portfolio got clobbered and when his portfolio got clobbered he uh, went back and did a very holistic analysis of how one should invest where there is very strong downside protection there is very low risk and there is a disproportionate upside and he came up with a framework which was uh, you know published in security analysis that it's gone through like seven or eight editions now but the security analysis is basically the bible of uh, value investing and uh, and and ben graham basically came up uh, with this uh, just two or three main ideas which have been the cornerstone of how Buffett uh, started investing. The first is that you're not buying and selling pieces of paper, you're buying ownership, fractional ownership of a business, and you should think of it as if you were buying the entire business. So that's the first mindset in terms of how you should think about uh, buying and selling stocks. The second is that uh, you should insist on a margin of safety. So all companies are worth the sum of all cash they'll produce from now till judgment day, discounted by some reasonable interest rate. He said, if you can figure that out, then you want to be buying it well below that price. And the third, which is probably a very important concept, this concept of Mr. Market, where Mr. Market shows up every 15 minutes, every 10 minutes, kind of a manic depressive uh, character. And he's continuously giving you quotes on any business you want under the sun. And uh, your, your job is to make Mr. Market work for you and not the other way around. So when Mr. Market serves you prices that are way too low, you should be buying and when he serves you prices way too high, you should be selling to him. And so those were the cornerstones. And uh, because he came out of the Great Depression and you know, 70, 80% collapse in indices and so on, he uh, came up with this net-net framework of buying things at two-thirds of current assets, which would be really, really low, not even paying anything for plant and equipment, uh, net current assets. And, and if, you, if you did that, you would do extremely well, except those types of businesses are very hard to find today. And um, I think where Ben Graham led us astray is his focus was to buy a business or 50 cents or 40 cents or 30 cents. And then as it approached its intrinsic value of a dollar, if it had not grown, then you sold the business. So he was very focused on downside protection. And in reality, I think in investing, what happens is you make the most money by investing in businesses which have long growth runways. And significantly increase intrinsic value over time. And so, for example, in, in the Ben Graham framework, if you were an investor in Walmart in the 70s, and if Walmart got up to like, you know, 40, 50 times earnings, well before that, a Ben Graham type investor would exit. And that would be terrible because uh, kind of missed the forest from the trees. The idea is that if you own great compounding machines, you shouldn't actually be selling even when it crosses intrinsic value, even when it crosses intrinsic value by 20, 30, 40%, as long as the, the nature of the business is very sound and robust. And so that particular shift, which is holding things above intrinsic value would be blasphemy in the Graham world. And I, for most of my career, stuck to that intrinsic value being the kind of the red line, right? And I think it was a mistake. And so, uh, but you know, like they say, you get old too soon and wise too late. We we finally figured it out, I think two, three years ago. And now I have 22 years of runway left before I leave planet earth. So we still have some room to make amends. So is that, because you have been, like I said, characterized as a value, a value investor, whatever that means, right? And your there was a report issued in 2020 saying that you were kind of shifting your strategy. Is what you just described about holding beyond intrinsic 
whatever the quote intrinsic value is, and I'm not even sure I know what that means, that does that describe, you know, a, a, a somewhat of a change in philosophy in your organization or, you know, where, because right. so, how, how, how can anybody in a market environment like we've had at least until December 31, which was really growth oriented, how can somebody be a successful value investor given valuations? So uh, value and growth are joined at the hip. They're two sides of the same coin. And so there is no such thing as growth investing versus value investing. All intelligent investing is value investing. And so if I bought a, a business which had a billion dollar market cap and for the next 50 years would produce 100 million a year in cash flow nonstop and then disappear after that. I can use interest rates and such and come up with an intrinsic value for the business by discounting those cash flows back to today. And if I were to buy another business which had a billion dollar market cap, 100 million in cash flows growing 10% a year, for example, and in 25 or 30 years, that business disappeared. I could also discount those cash flows back and I would come up with a value. Both those companies have a specific value. And one would want to invest where the difference between what you're paying and what it's worth is greater. Now, the difficulty in investing is that figuring out future cash flows is really hard. In, in most cases, it's impossible. But in a sliver of cases, you can get some semblance of putting some boundaries on. And, and so growth and value are the same thing for value investors. They, they would look at both. My framework change wasn't a change in this growth versus value. I have been a value investor, which encompasses growth since the since 1994 when I started doing this. So there's no change there. The change was on holding things above intrinsic value. So if I own a Walmart or I own an Amazon and I have a fix on the intrinsic value, which is an intrinsic value, John Burr Williams designed it you know, maybe a hundred years ago, uh, 92 years ago, actually, he, he said, sum of all cash that's going to come out of the enterprise from now till judgment day discounted by a reasonable interest rate. That's the intrinsic value of any business. And so holding, holding above perceived intrinsic value, especially when the runway is very long and the business is getting better, that's the, that's the important change. And, uh, and that's the change. I. Made. So does that mean that when you say holding I mean, I'm a, I'm a little confused. Holding above intrinsic value suggests that you expect the value to continue to increase. So let me let me let and, me. And a, so you're not. It's not. It's well, not holding so, above intrinsic so value. Let's let's go to the real world and let's leave the definitions behind because the definitions don't work in the real world because we cannot estimate future cash flows. I mean, if I if I asked anyone. What is the future cash flow of Facebook? What's the future cash flow of Berkshire Hathaway? I mean, there are no, there's no firm answer because it's it's unknown. And especially when you go five or 10 years out, it becomes really fuzzy. So let's go into the real world because we have to practice this art in the real world. In 2019, I was in Istanbul and I visited a company where the market cap was $20 million to zero. And the liquidation value of the business was eight hundred million dollars. So, I'm glad That's you're a bit awake. Of a mismatch. I'm I'm <laughs> so glad you're awake now. So basically, this was a business. And by the way, what what happened in 2019 to me in Istanbul never happened to me in the previous 28 or 26 years of investing, and will not happen again till I die. But it illustrates what I'm about to say because this is a real case. Okay. So, uh, and I wish HBS the case on this company. It'd be fun. It'd be a fun case to read. The, well, first the of all, what has, is the what the is name, the company? The name of the company is Resas Logistics. R E Y S A S. So Resas Logistics was sitting at a twenty million dollar market cap, 
And my friend, who's a you know, died in the wool, uh, Ben Graham investor, I had told him to just take me to all the companies in his portfolio when I was visiting Istanbul, and he took me to Resas. And um, when when we were driving there, he explained to me that the liquidation value of the business was eight hundred million, and the market cap was twenty million. I said, "Is it fraudulent? Like, what are we looking at here? What's going on here?" He said, "No." He said, it's really simple to value the business because they have 12 million square feet of warehouses. They're 99% leased to blue chip companies, Ikea, Carrefour, Amazon, so on. 10-year leases, inflation index, all of that. And any broker would give you a price on those warehouses. And when you look at these 83 warehouses and you just you know, look at what is the going market rate for these things, that's where you end up with. You, you end up with about a billion dollars of value, about 200 million of debt, and you end up with 800 million. And I met the father and son who run the company. They seem like perfectly smart, honest people to me. And I said, okay, if I try to buy the stock, maybe I'll get $100,000 worth or something, you know, some Mickey Mouse amount, and that'll be that. And what ended up happening is because Turkey is, such a crazy market where people don't value things. I ended up buying a third of the company for $7 million, which we still own today. Now, I gave you liquidation value. I didn't give you future cash flows, right? Because liquidation value is something I could hang my hat on, right? I mean, I, it's a real number. I didn't even have to go into future cash flows. But what I realized once I met the guys running the business, is that they were really exceptional capital allocators. And I looked at the long history of all the different things they had done, and it was remarkable, every business they were in. So it's not just the warehouses. They are the largest uh, freight rail operator in Turkey. They have the largest truck fleet in Turkey. Uh, they're the largest forklift rental company. They have large numbers of vehicle inspection statement stations, which are required every two years. Number of great businesses. And what I and and it was hard to value all those businesses because those are cash flows and stuff which become fuzzy. But I didn't care about valuing those businesses because even if they were worth zero, I was I still had the eight hundred million. And uh, so we bought the business. We bought one third of it. It's gone up five or six times in the last two three years in dollars. Still sitting at ten cents on the dollar. So still a long ways to go. But now we get to intrinsic value. I don't care about liquidation value, intrinsic value. Intrinsic value of RESAS, and it's gone up since the 2019. I think RESAS's liquidation value now is about a billion, at least a billion. And intrinsic value, which is because adding in what the father-son can bring to the table, maybe it might be worth one and a half billion. So what I wanted to say is that if tomorrow a business like RESAS got actually valued at one and a half billion, and we had something like 7 million turn into 500 million, if that were to happen, I would not sell a single share. I would hold above intrinsic value in that particular case because the son is 37 years old and the son, I think, is better than the father. So what I'm trying to say here is now we have a real world case. We were able to make the investment not worrying about intrinsic value. And at least now, even when I take an optimistic view of intrinsic value, I would go above that because of the nature and quality of the business. Well, let me ask you a, a couple of questions about that. I mean, I understand that. And you're basically, the good news is you have hard assets leased with cash flows you can actually value to be comfortable with the liquidation value number. But Turkey is an interesting example of a, and, uh, of a case where the macro issues associated with, with Turkey, which is a wonderful in Istanbul. I love Istanbul. Um, and it's beautiful. It's beautiful to talk oh, about stunning. macro now because the, the inflation in the U.S. is Mickey Mouse. Well, let no, me forget, let forget me the U.S. But, inflation. But, but let, before we go, we'll come back to the U.S. and talk about what's going on in the U.S., but in Turkey, you had a situation in which 
the president of the country had done some things that that really did not help the macro environment, economic environment of the country. Their currency tanked. And so you had sort of these confluence of events of Ergodon doing things that were not the smartest thing in the world to do with respect to its, its country's economic situation. And so you go into uh, a, an investment like that, and, and you have said that the, the micro trumps the macro. Is that a fair summary? Yeah, of so, so actually, Turkey is a very beautiful case to have this micro versus macro discussion. Because when I invested in 2019, a few things were very clear to me. It was very clear to me that inflation, which was running 50% a year, real inflation is 50% a year. The official rate is 25%, which is, you know, fiction. Nonsense. Uh, yeah. So we have 50% inflation a year, which means the currency will probably weaken at 50% a year. And I, so when we invested in Resas in 2019, it was five Turkish lira to the dollar. Today, as I speak to you, it's approaching 15 Turkish lira to the dollar. Okay. So I've had a 70% decline in the lira. In dollars, that investment is up 6x. In lira, it's up 18x. But who cares about the lira? We care about dollars. So why did I invest when I saw a massive uh, inflation because so what was happening in Turkey and what is still happening in Turkey is everyone and their brother has exited the the country. That's part of the reason that it's actually the cheapest market in the world. I'm I'm the most orgasmic about investing in Turkey versus any other place in the world. And, and I should and, tell the audience they have it's, it's Istanbul is a ma- it's a fabulous city. I just spent I just spent three weeks in Istanbul, and it was a blast. It was just awesome. So all of you that if you're trying to do your, you know, your scheduled vacate vacays, um, as I know you all are, I would put Istanbul high on the list. The food's the, amazing. The the grilled blue fish from the Brosphorus. That's what it's all about. The grilled blue fish. Okay. But anyway, let's get back. I digress. Mm-hmm. So uh, basically, uh, there are businesses in Turkey which benefit from inflation. And there are businesses that get hurt by inflation. Resas is a business that is actually a beneficiary. So the more crazy the macro environment environment gets, uh, the better it is for them. So for example, just to the government has artificially kept interest rates low, which is what is causing a lot of turmoil. All their debt, and they hardly have any, any debt now, is at 14% in Turkish lira. Their leases, which get inflation index, you know, rents every year, even at the official rate, increase at 25%. And when the lease expires after 10 years, it goes to market rate. And so bottom line is the CapEx was done in yesterday's lira. The revenue comes in today's dollars or euros or lira. And uh, Resas is not hurt at all. In fact, I want this thing to continue because it gives them more tailwind. There are other businesses in Turkey. For example, there's a juice manufacturer where 98% is exported and revenue is in euros. And all expenses are in lira. And And wages are not going up at the rate of inflation. So the Turks are getting poorer. But that company has rising profits in in euros in the light of this macro. So what I'm just what I'm saying is, a lot of businesses, most businesses get hurt in this scenario, and most businesses in Tur- in Turkey I have no interest in because they would be hurt. But some don't get hurt, and sometimes you get such a large margin of safety, like I got with Resas, that I could ignore a lot of the macro events. And I think that in the end, Resas will be a Huge home run. So that is how I think of micro and macro. I look at the business. I look at what's going on outside and then we take it from there. Okay. So, you know, and that's a great example of your 
philosophy in terms of trying to balance the two. Let's come back to the United States because most of the audience here is here. And we have seen, you know, an extraordinary, in, in a very short period of time, an extraordinary bump in inflation in a quarter, basically. And we have, you know, the government bond yields are, you know, depending on which duration you look at, they're hovering around 2%, while inflation is at 7 or 8% which is not good. I think we could agree with that, right? Well, if you're a fixed income investor buying treasuries, it's definitely not good. It's, it's really sad. So, you know, what does this kind of portend for the United States and how do you feel about the US economy, which is for better or for worse, still the largest economy in the world. And there's these, I mean, these numbers you have on the one hand, fabulous employment numbers that just came out yes on Friday, yes, the, the day before yesterday, and inflation running it looks like at eight percent. Wages are going up. Like, how do you how do you make sense of all of this? Are we are we go are we headed? We have growth, but are we headed to a recession? Are we headed towards stagflation? I mean, I know so, you may not think about so the, that. But so the way, the, the way my little brain works is, <laughs> all, is all these things cannot be figured out by my little brain. And my, my little brain doesn't even try to figure them out. Okay, What my little brain does is it starts with a business. It does not start with the economy and all the factors you mentioned. So I hone in on a business. So let's say, for example, I look at a business like Amazon, for example. I don't, I don't own Amazon, but let's take that example. What I am focused on is I just want to understand what a business like that looks like five or 10 years from now, 15 years from now. And for most businesses, I cannot figure it out. And so I say, okay, you know, I can't do much here because I don't know what it looks like. Once in a while, we get some clarity on some business like I did with Waystars, for example, and we can step up. So before we even get to the macro, even if I say it's 2% inflation and 2% interest rates and nothing is, everything is benign, going back, you know, two, three years, for example, even in that environment, the difficulty is trying to figure out what the future trajectory of these businesses is. And there's a small sliver of businesses where based on circle of competence, I think I can figure out the trajectory with something like a 50 to 60% success rate. It means that if I made 10 bets, maybe five or six out of 10, I might be correct. And 40, 50%, I will not be correct. In that, in with, with those types of batting averages, the results would be great. And, uh, and, and so I don't, I don't waste a lot of my time or spend a lot of my time trying to figure out things that I know people who spend their whole lives on this can't figure out. And uh, so that's just way above my pay grade. And, uh, and so I, I, you know, in Buffett terms, I look for things that are absolute no brainers that is hitting you in your head with like a two by four. And it's, it's absolutely, you don't have to think about things too much to know that it's going to work. And uh, that's where our focus is. So, but I, I think it's important for the audience to understand because you are perceived as a quote, value investor. And what I hear you to say is that that's not really the right characterization. And the shift most recently away from growth, because the, the market in this past quarter has penalized growth a lot. Um, yeah, but we're not concerned yeah. about one quarter here or one quarter there. I think so. If I look at the US, for example, I think the last time, well, I, I made an investment uh, in March, April 2020, uh, right when everything was imploding, uh, you know, with the pandemic. But 
I only have one company in our portfolio that is in the United States. And we made that investment in 2018. So, you know, and we made another investment in 2020, which we don't own anymore. But what I'm saying is that when I look at things in the United States currently, I cannot come up with things that are obvious investments that my little brain can understand. And, uh, and so, you know, I go to places where things are a little bit more palatable and understandable. And I think like a place like Turkey is great because there's so much fear that the baby got thrown out of the bathwater. And so uh, we, uh, if I spend my time on 50 Turkish companies, that's a much more worthwhile thing for me to do uh, than anything else. Which, you know, I can't disagree with that because I look at the United States right now and none of it makes any sense. <laughs> yeah, so if things, if thing, you know, the thing that Buffett says is that if, you, if things don't make sense, there's no compulsion to act. You know, in, in investing, we don't make money when we buy a stock. and We don't make money when we sell a stock. We make money by waiting. We make money by being patient and we make money by picking our spot. So anytime something doesn't make sense, take a pass and it's okay to so take a pass on 99% you, of stuff. So let me ask you this, because it's really hard to take a pass if you have capital that's been committed to you. How do you deal with it? I mean, do you learn to just, I mean, so for the audience benefit, you know, you're living in, in um, Austin, correct? Yes. Do you just like go play golf? I mean, what do you do? And what do you do with money that's been allocated to you when you don't find if the market isn't there, that's, you know, if the market isn't giving you what you want? You know, in a, in a typical year, I may find one, two or three things to buy. And I may, I may find one, two or three things to sell. It could be zero. It could be three. It's in that range. And the job description is to read, to read and think, not to act. So I love reading and I'm reading all the time. And the reading sometimes is directly related to investments and a lot of times it's not. And I mean, uh, to give you an example, I'm reading a book right now called The CEO Factory. And it's a great book. And it may never have any relevance to any investing I ever do, but it was written by a guy who used to be with uh, Unilever's uh, subsidiary in India, Hindustan Unilever, which for 65 years has compo compounded at 16% a year. Uh, it's a spectacular business. It's done way better than Unilever has. And uh, I think that uh, I'm really enjoying that book. It's a great book. It's explaining why the company produces all these CEOs that go to do such great work in other companies. So what I'm saying is that, you know, I like reading. I like thinking. I'm not particularly concerned that we aren't able to find anything this quarter or next quarter or whatever. And if my investors are expecting me to be, you know, doing something every week in terms of buying or selling, well, they invested with the wrong guy. and They will figure out they need, they need to exit. And uh, so I'm not particularly concerned about, you know, assets under management or what my investors think or will they take their money away and all of that. The way I look at it is that, you know, if all my money under management went away, it's okay. I would just manage the money I had and that'd be fine too. I just have more of resource for myself. And that okay. there's nothing wrong with that. You know, I just make Resas half my portfolio and uh, okay. work, work from there. Alan, I, I see you coming back on screen. So I think you want to open it up to Q&A. Is that correct? Uh, yes, yes. I think this would be a good time to, to hand over to the audience. And we have a couple of questions queued up already. Um, Monish, you've talked in the past about using checklists in your investment process. And what advice do you have for students seeking to create their own checklist? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, uh, I created I created the checklist uh, uh, mainly uh, the I guess the framework I used 
and this was, I think, about 14, 14 years ago, was I looked at investments that were made by great investors where the results were negative. They lost money. And uh, that's really kind of public knowledge because we have 13 Fs they file when they buy and 13 Fs they file when they sell. So we were able to figure out, you know, which investments Warren Buffett made where he made money or lost money or, you know, a a number of investors that we respect. Then the second question we asked is if a business, if a investment ended up with a negative return, was there data available before the investment made? So first of all, we understand try to understand why did the investment not work? And then the third question we ask ourselves was, was that visible before the investment was made? So for example, so exa- for example, sometimes, and so let's, let's take the example of US Air. US Air was an investment Warren Buffett had made uh, a long time ago, and it did, not, it did not go well. In the end, he ended up not losing money, but for a while it was, it didn't do well. And the reason it didn't do well was he misread the moat. So Southwest Airlines had come in, they were a low cost provider and they really hammered US Air's uh, Pittsburgh hub and so on. And that was visible. That was visible before the investment was made. So it was related to competition and moats, misreading of competition and moats. Um, so what ended up happening when we created this checklist was it, fell into a number of very nice buckets. Why did investments not work? The largest single largest reason investments did not work was leverage. So leverage has been an Achilles heel for a lot of business. The second biggest reason was some kind of misunderstanding on the moat or competitive advantage of the business. So the investor basically misunderstood or uh, basically couldn't couldn't really figure out that the moat wasn't as deep and wide as they thought they were. Then there were the third issue was, you know, things like management ownership. There were issues with the nature of management or the nature of ownership, which again was visible before. And then you got into some other issues like unions and things like that. So, but these three were the big ones, right? Leverage, uh, moats, and management. And so the checklist ended up I think currently the checklist I use has about 170 questions on it, and it it really carries more than its weight in a big way. So when I've done the research on investment, uh, before I pull the trigger, I run the checklist. And what happens is the biggest value it adds is there will usually be at least seven, eight, or 10 questions, which I don't know the answer to. And that's the biggest, I would say, uh, benefit of the checklist because it forces me to do more research. And sometimes to answer those 10 questions might take another month or two of figuring it out. And then we can again go back and run the checklist when we have all those answers. And then we are able to see what are the weak points in the business, what could cause a problem. And when we can see that, then we can make a go, no go decision because there are, there are no businesses which have no issues. Every business has issues. The question is, how, how does it kind of lay out and how comfortable can you get with the issues surrounding the business? Like, for example, in 2012, we invested in Fiat Chrysler and we knew the auto industry is horrible. But we also knew that all the union contracts had been redone and Detroit had become a great place to make cars and so on. And the markets didn't, didn't yet understand that. And so that's an example of, you know, digging in and going in even when there were unions and there were competitive advantage issues and all of that. Super interesting. Um, Another question from the audience goes, I've learned from your Barron's interview and a few other lectures that you're a big fan of Seritage Growth Properties. Uh, You've owned it since 2016 and built a major position in 2020 again. Uh, You had a good friend, Guy Spire, also owning it but you recently exited over two thirds of the position while the price is still depressed. How did your view of intrinsic value change for SRG? What data point made you change your mind? Yeah, so actually we don't own Seritage anymore, which makes it easy for me to talk about it. Uh, Basically we we bought Seritage 
right when the pandemic was hitting in the second quarter of 2020. And uh, the stock had collapsed. It was uh, $30 odd a share uh, before the pandemic. And it was kind of hovering between 6 and $9 a share after the pandemic hit because there was a lot of concern about, you know, retail and footprints and all of that with all the lockdowns. And I analyzed it and it looked really cheap and looked like the very significant upside because they were redeveloping all the old seer space and such. Last year, I concluded that I had made a mistake in one part of the Seritage thesis. And the one part of the thesis was that they are redeveloping all of these properties. And it's really kind of like a, you know, a company which runs in a hundred different countries because each municipality and each city and, and location has its own nuances about how they look at uh, the approvals and rezonings and different things that the company needs. And I realized that I had underestimated how difficult moving that aircraft carrier with all those different geographies and, and battles. And so uh, we had bought it so cheap that we still were with very significant gain when we were selling. And because I, I saw that this was a, a, a flaw in the analysis, and one thing uh, one should always keep in mind, which I already talked about, is John Templeton used to say the best analysts will be right two out of three times. And probably more realistically in investing, we'll probably be right about half the time. So one of the things that's really important in investing is to be honest with yourself. And when I realized that the redevelopment challenges are much more significant than I had estimated, you know, I took my chips off the table and so it was a mistake, but it was a mistake where we ended up with a positive result. But I think the big mistake was that in the second quarter of 2020, there were lots and lots of companies available cheap. And we here we ended up, you know, depending on when we were selling, somewhere between 20 to 40% return on our money. And I think we could have gotten a lot more uh, with a different bet. So that's that's the unfortunate part. The, opportunity cost was high. Um, another question from the audience is, I guess, how do you balance modeling your investment principles after someone else's success, like that of Warren Buffett, versus building your own through experience? So that's a great question. And uh, I am what you might call a shameless cloner. And I think it would be quite foolhardy in the investment world to not ride on the shoulders of giants. I think a lot of smart people, many of them dead, have done a lot of heavy lifting. And to try to sit down and create everything by yourself, nobody is that smart. So Ben Graham put some frameworks in place. Uh, Warren Buffett has built on that framework quite significantly. and others will build beyond that. And uh, I think if, if I were to focus on Graham, Buffett, and Munger, especially Munger, I think that's a tremendous uh, uh, framework to use. So I'll, gi I'll give a, uh, some real world examples of companies that are cloners, that don't figure it out themselves, that have done really well. So almost everything Microsoft has had success at, they have either stolen legally or illegally from some other company. They have a very large budget for their research labs, which in several decades has produced almost nothing. You know, tens of billions of dollars being spent on research. But if you look at Word, it was lifted from Word Perfect. If you look at Excel, it was lifted from, lifted from Lotus 1, 2, 3. If you look at Teams, it's coming from Zoom. And if you look at Microsoft Edge, you know, from Google Chrome and they annihilated Netscape and you know stole from them and whatever else, on and on, you know, money from Quicken that they've never got much traction. Even search, uh, you know, Bing, you know what Bing stats for stands for? Bing stats for, but it's not Google. 
and and uh, so uh, basically we would not have a business like microsoft if they said we're going to invent everything internally and uh, and even even uh, even when you look at uh, a business like burger king so mcdonald's has a, a large uh, you know army of people who focus on figuring out locations locations are really important for fast food and burger king has two guys and they just look at where mcdonald's is putting up locations and then they go and close it and those two guys and their dog uh, do pretty well and uh, repeatedly you will find so if you look at ryanair in europe you know they cloned the the southwest model and uh, and went from there and so many many airlines around the world have cloned the southwest model and in fact the only ones that have done well are the ones who have cloned the southwest model anyone else who tried to do any other type of airline just fell flat and and went bankrupt so cloning is there's this there's, there's something weird in the human psyche which looks down on cloning they think it's kind of beneath ourselves like what you just said like you know we should do our own work and i think that's a very tough way to go through life i i like to go through life in a easy manner so for example when i went to turkey i didn't go to turkey and say okay i'm going to go visit 100 turkish companies i knew a guy who was a very good ben graham investor who was very thoughtful and he had already put money behind a bunch of companies and so i said hider let's go visit the companies in your portfolio because that's a winnow down list that has already gone through one brain and uh, even when i'm looking at in idea generation i look at data roma a bunch of uh, investors like i like to look at what bill ackman's doing you know everything bill ackman does doesn't work some things work some things don't but you know we know there's a 50% batting average but it's better than throwing darts and picking picking stocks to drill down on So cloning is a very powerful idea. If you embrace cloning, you will get a massive edge on your fellow peers and humans, and people will look down on it. And that's okay. We have no shame. We are shameless cloners. On that topic, and you already gave away one. And this might be our last question for today. But are there any new fund managers you found admirable, and would recommend the students study and clone? Yeah so I think there's always there's always new managers emerging and one of the things about the investment business that's important to remember Joel Greenblatt pointed this out is when investment managers start out they have very little capital sometimes they just have their own capital or their family's capital It might even be just a million dollars or 5 million dollars very small amount and with 1 million 5 million 10 million you will be looking in nooks and crannies that a lot of other people don't because you could make a half million dollar investment or a 100,000 dollar investment and it could move the needle and the the great ones in that group when they start compounding by definition that 5 million is going to become 50 million and then 500 million and they will no longer be able to make a 100,000 dollar bet or 500,000 dollar bet the bet size increase which means they have to leave the bottom they have to leave the bottom which gave them all the success and so in investing what happens is the bottom continuously gets cleared out of great talent because the great talent moves up the food chain and the bottom gets available to the new emerging more managers and uh, so there are some there are some managers i think josh tarasoff is uh, one name that comes to mind I I like Andrew Wilkinson a lot you know he runs Tiny Capital out of uh, Victoria uh, in uh, British Columbia and uh, he's at tiny.com and uh, so there's there's a bunch of these uh, guys who are very well versed in the emerging technologies and looking into different nooks and crannies there's a guy I recently became friends with he's not a public equities investor but he's really smart on the tech side and he's been making really astute private investments into really really tiny 
tech companies. I mean, these are companies with, you know, maybe even 100,000, half a million of revenue. Uh, but then he's able to help them grow that and such. So I think that this is the great news about investing is that the bottom's always available. And then if you do well, you move up with the rest. Munish and Nori, thank you so much for being generous with your time and, and making this a great, great event for, for all students today. Um, well, Alan and uh, and Nori, it was a pleasure to hang out with you guys and uh, always, always fun to talk to uh, HBS students, and I think you've got other other MBA students as well. So yeah, it, it wonderful. Was, and I thank you for your time, Alan. Thanks, and to the entire team that put this together. And I only have one question. So, Monish, again, going back to the beginning and seeing all those car things on your wall, what kind of car do you drive? Well, you know, I I had to go full Texan after moving to Austin. I just moved to Austin. I just got a, a Ram Longhorn and, uh, and it is so awesome. And, you know, I got to know the owners of Ferrari when I owned the, owned, owned the stock and it's a very deep regret of mine that, uh, so I'm, I'm not a Ferrari kind of guy, but I felt like I made so much money on Ferrari that I should own a Ferrari. So I, I approached them, you know, usually Ferraris have two or three year wait lists. So they said, Monish, we can help you with delivery. We cannot help you with price. Ferrari never discounts anything. So I said, I wasn't looking at any discount. Delivery advancement is fine. So I got my, my 488 Spider Ferrari in 2018. And um, that was uh, such a joy and fun to own. But when I moved here, because I live in the hills and it's a very low car, it just wasn't practical. So I... I got rid of the Ferrari and I got my Ram Longhorn for one fourth the price. And, uh, and also by, by the way, in the entire period, I owned the Ferrari. It never went down in price. It just stayed where it was. It was great. But I also have a Alfa Romeo Stelvio, which is great. It's got a Ferrari engine in it. So I still have Ferrari in the garage kind of camouflaged and uh, Maserati Levante. So they're all part of Fiat Chrysler because I'm loyal to them and I'll always be loyal to them. But my favorite car, my favorite car is, is the long car. Well, that's, you know, my son would applaud that because he's got a big ass truck. <laughs> um, pardon my French. I'm, I, I'm Alan. I'm sorry. I, I, I know I'm not supposed to say that. And, but I did have years ago, a Maserati as well. So I have to confess that. So anyway, I, you know, Monisha, it was uh, a delight to have you. Thank you so much for giving all of us your time and your insights. It was, you know, really, really appreciated and remarkable. So thank you so much. And I don't know, you know, we, we can't, I don't, we can't applaud, can we, Alan? Because no, the, 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 you can only can't. raise your hand. You can only raise your hand on, on Zoom, but you can applaud. But that's okay. Anyway, that, that'll be in the next you. release. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. All the best. Bye. Thank Take you. Care. And with that, we conclude the 2022 investment conference. Uh, just a quick address to, to the attendees. Big thank you for all the keynote speakers for donating their time and wisdom to us and just making this an overall uh, awesome event for students year in, year out. Same goes to our moderators. Thank you for volunteering your time on a Sunday to help us host this event and make it a great discussion and learning opportunity for, for, for our students. A uh, big shout out to Investment Conference Planning Team and the broader Investment Club Leadership Board for doing a great job in organizing this event and the conference together this year. Um, and thank you to the sponsors as well. Uh, your generous support allows us to continue hosting events like these throughout the year. And last but not least, thank you to all our attendees for tuning in today and making this a great event. Uh, we look forward to host you, hosting you again next year, hopefully in person. Uh, until then, take care and bye-bye. And